Um, welcome to the next session. Um, please do subscribe to the conference Slack channel. We will pop the link in the chat. And this is a lightning, uh, a lightning session. So each presenter is going to have eight minutes to speak. I am going to be timing people and I will crash into your talk if you go over eight minutes. Please be aware of that. Um, unfortunately, because of the tight schedule, we don't have any room for questions directly in this session, but please do go to Remo afterwards to join the discussion, chat to the panelists. And again, I will pop the link in the chat now. So uh, I think we have live captioning enabled. I'm hoping that everything is working. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker to start, and that is uh, Sabina Bischoff, who is speaking about openness and transparent communication in animal-based research. Sabina. Thank you for the kind introduction. I hope you can see my slides in the presentation mode, actually. And um, my topic today will be the openness and transparent communication in animal-based research. I would like to present you our project, the so-called so so -called CISLAS, that means um, Critical Incident Reporting System in Lab Animal Science. And I will repeat that in the further uh, slides, as you can remember the, um, the short word for that. Um, I'm veterinarian, and since 2003, I'm working with the lab animals. And um, through my work at the Universal Hospital, I know how important it is to talk about failure. And um, therefore, uh, in order to improve the well being of patients. And therefore, we implemented already in 2015 a critical incident reporting system for lab animal science. And that is the topic I wanted to introduce it to, to you today. Sorry. Um, during the last uh, few months, we see a remarkable progress and transparency in, in lab animal science. For example, on the 1st of July this year, we had a great global, me uh, glo global social media campaign supported by the ERA, and on the same day, the German Transparency Agreement for Lab Animal Science was launched on, by the DFG, that means the German Research Association, with, together with the information platform Understanding Animal Research. On this day, um, a lot of countries all over the world were part of this campaign and started talking transparently, transparently on lab animal science in general. And um, all these initiatives had the aim to transparently inform about animal research and to get actively involved and to an open dialogue about that. But when we think about talking about failures, how far does our transparency go? How do, we, how do we deal with unexpected events? Is it easy for us to talk about failure? And should we publish data from failed studies? Let us have a look on human medicine and learn from their constructive culture of error. First, CS, the so-called failure databases in human medicine were launched in the 1980s already. And since 2013, it's obligatory for every hospital in Germany to provide a failure database in order to improve the patient health and welfare by peer learning from mistakes, near misses, critical incidents, or even undesired events. And when we talk about openness and transparent communication and research, we see a strong need for a constructive culture of error in animal-based research as well. So we think and we support the central idea of a culture of care instead of a blame and shame culture. So no one has to blame or to be ashamed by reporting transparently about happened mistakes, near misses, critical incidents, or even undesired events during animal experiments. All these actions are important to improve our animal safety. How can you reach that as a researcher in an experiment? Well, it's not so difficult as you might think. Let's just start talking about unsuccessful experiments. And that is the topic I wanted to introduce you today in the, in the short talk. On this page, you can see the web page, the web-based CSLAS portal, the critical incident reporting system for lab animal science. Even on the starting page, you can get a lot of information, information about the project itself, and you are able to report a critical incident which happened in your experiment. 
on the next slide, you can see the first part of the form where you are able to introduce or to um, upload the critical incident. And as you will see, when you inform on our webpage, you will see it will take you only a few minutes to give all the information which are needed to describe the critical incident. And so we invite you to convince yourself it's very easy to work transparently. On the slide, you can see some of the latest reports on the web-based CSLAS. And actually we see on more than 200, sorry, 200 registered users on our webpage and more than 50 reports are already uploaded and all the registered users can learn from them, from these uploaded reports. But when it's so easy as it may seem to be, the progress on transparency and lab animal-based research depends on a working failure management which must be supported by the facility administration. That's very important. And in my opinion, the scientific progress also benefits from reports on unsuccessful experiments and will be successful without wasting lab animals and resources. And now it's up to you. Inform us, inform you on our webpage, join us and become part of the CSLAS and transparent communication. And with slide, I would like to thank you for your openness and transparent communication and for your attention. I'm open for your question. I'm happy to answer everything. And I would like to thank my team, our funding, Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany and the cooperation partner, the Suya Center in Gießen, Larry Cooper from Norway and the Animal Study, Study Registry from Berlin. Thank you. Thank you, Shun, Sabina. Uh, you were ahead of time. That's absolutely fantastic. If anyone would <laughs> like you. to ask Sabina questions after her talk, please do join the speakers in the Remo session after yeah. the whole talk. So thank you very much, Sabina. So the next person we have is Thomas Hostler, who's going to be talking about open research and academic capitalism. Thomas, come to the stage and your time starts now. Thanks, can you see the screen, hear me? Yep, all yeah, good. Cool, um, so yeah, so I'm Tom. So I'm a senior lecturer in psychology at Manchester Metropolitan University, but I'm also doing a master's in higher education studies. And that's led me to this topic of open research and academic capitalism. So uh, in higher education studies, the kind of object of interest is the university as an entity. And academic capitalism describes how universities are increasingly uh, competing with each other in a market context. And they're competing over students, but they're also competing over research, which feeds into you know, the worldwide university rankings. So academic capitalism influences how research is organized within universities, which areas of research they fund, and who is employed and how to do the research. So you can think of this as being, well, who manages the endeavor of research as a, as a you know, collaborative, you know, knowledge production. And we see a shift from this being managed by a self-regulated community of academics who decide what is researched, who are generally intrinsically motivated to answer questions because they're interesting and who want to share those answers as a public good. And the output and quality of research is assessed by the community through peer review. And we see a shift to universities, instead of just being places where these academics happen to work and pay their salaries, to the universities being actors themselves and strategically managing the academics in order to be competitive and increase their capital. So universities start to decide what is researched. Um, this is a picture from my faculty's areas of excellence and the university compels us to only research you know, uh, things that fall into these categories and, you know, wanting to do research in order to either move up the rankings or to, if possible, commodify uh, and make money out of the knowledge that's generated. And the quality and the outputs are generally assessed by reductive metrics, such as um, citation counts and journal impact factors. So open research is um, as most of us know, uh, kind of initially a grassroots movement uh, designed to make every part of the research process open, available, 
and uh, free. So this includes practical initiatives to promote sharing plans, data, uh, materials, analysis and outputs as publicly and freely as possible. And then these initiatives then help to enable broader developments such as big team science uh, and diversity and in inclusivity initiatives. And, you know, the grassroots open research, open science movement is a good example of something that's been developed by this, you know, the community of academics and is broadly aligned with, you know, this kind of utopian way of doing science and Matonian norms. So what I'm interested in is, well, how do these things, you know, interact with each other? And on the face of it, you would think, well, they're, they're kind of in opposition, right? Open research is all about promoting and sh uh, sharing knowledge for free as a public good, as openly and freely as possible. It's about sharing resources with other academics. So instead of hoarding data for yourself to get as many publications, you're sharing it for free and you're reducing the competitiveness between researchers and helping you know, your colleagues who might not have as many resources. Uh, working in a really transparent way also disincentivizes people using questionable research practices like you know, salami slicing and pea hacking, you know, which are done in order to game the metric-based assessment of research used by universities. And when we have a completely tr transparent and open project, then it's easier for the academic community to make a qualitative judgment of how good the research is. And then, you know, a lot of open research is also about collaboration and working communally, especially these, you know, big team science projects, which we've had a few talks about, but then also sharing the social capital generated from that. So putting everyone who worked on the project on the paper as an author, uh, and then using something like a contributorship statement. But I'm also interested in, you know, the areas in actually where these things might align. Um, so, you know, there is an argument for open research that's made in kind of capitalist terms about in increasing the efficiency of research and extracting the maximum value for money from a piece of research for the funders. And this is something that obviously universities are going to be very interested in for their own benefits. And there's increasing calls for open research to, you know, be kind of introduced from a top down perspective by funders, by policymakers, by universities, but it then becomes another area of research for the institution to measure and manage, you know, for their own ends, basically. Um, and whilst open research practices, when they're promoted bottom up from a grassroots thing, they're quite flexible um, in the way that people can use them. When they start coming from top down, they're inevitably going to become less flexible. There's going to be stricter definitions of what openness is and what it isn't. And again, reductive ways of measuring it and inevitably more bureaucracy and administration. You know, if a university decides we want all our academics to do pre-registration, they're unlikely to say, oh, we know that takes time. So we're going to give you less essays to mark. And my final point is that I also think that open research practices can inadvertently facilitate the increasing casualization of research. So if you're working a researcher working on a long term project and you're working in a very closed way where you're the only one who can understand the analysis code and the way you've set up the the, you know, the database, then you're kind of a very crucial part of that research project. As soon as you start working in a way that's very open and providing detailed instruction so that anyone can come along and reproduce what you've done, you know, that's the kind of ideal aim for open research, then suddenly you're not quite as irreplaceable to that project or to the university. So that last point is a little bit speculative maybe, but I do think it's something that people need to kind of consider uh, perhaps long-term with promoting open research movements. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I'd be really interested to, to chat to anyone uh, who's kind of interested in the same things here. And if anyone knows any, you know, research that's been written on this already um, that you can share with me, I'd be very interested to read it. Uh, and I'll be in the Remo room afterwards. So thank you.
Thank you very much, Tom. Um, interesting to know if we're all just going to be replaced by open data <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, thank you. Our next talk is from Patricia Martinkova, who's talking about the topic, does a zero inter-rater reliability mean grant peer review is arbitrary? Patricia, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me try to share my slides. And, uh... Okay, so hello and welcome to this talk uh, on inter-rater reliability in grant peer review. Uh, my name is Patricia Martinkova. I come from Institute of Computer Science of the Czech Academy of Sciences. I'm a statistician and I will be presenting a joint work with Elena Aroshova and Carol Lee uh, from University of Washington. Uh, so the motivation for our research is the fact that the grant peer review allocates billions of dollars uh, of research funding. And when selecting which proposals to fund, uh, most great agencies rely on peer review for assessing the quality and potential impact of proposed research. So assessing the quality of the peer review is thus very important. One measure of the quality of the peer review is inter-rater reliability. In a simple words, this measure assesses the consistency among raters. And there are some accepted cutoff values, such as that inter-rater reliability above 0.6 signalizes good inter-rater reliability, while uh, inter-rater reliability below 0.3 is low. And uh, one recent and highly cited study by peer and colleagues found exactly zero inter-rater reliability in mock peer review of funded NIH proposals. Since then, this study has been cited as evidence of a complete arbitrariness in peer review. And so the main aim of our study was to answer a simple question. Uh, does a zero inter-rater reliability really mean that grant peer review is arbitrary? To answer this question, we took real data from a complete range of submissions to the National Institutes of Health and to the American Institute of Biological Sciences. And we calculated inter-rate reliability for a complete range of samples and for restricted samples of different ratios of top proposals. The figures on this slides, slide are of three types. On, on the left, we have the complete ranges of ratings each bar representing one proposal ordered from the best on the very left. And we see that the patterns of ratings are similar for the two rate agencies. In these middle figures, we have estimates of inter-rate reliability together with their confidence intervals. For the complete range of samples on the very right, and uh, for restricted samples of a given ratio. We see that for both grant agencies, the single rater inter-rater reliability for complete range of samples is about 0.3, which corresponds to multi-rater inter-rater reliability of over 0.6, considering the average of three raters is used. And this signalizes good inter-rater reliability. However, uh, local, uh, inter-rate reliability estimates from restricted samples uh, will likely be zero under many scenarios, including the case of proportion of about 20% of funded projects, as was the case in the peer et al. study. Finally, uh, on the right, we explored statistical reasons behind uh, zero inter-rate re inter reliability estimates, even in cases when the true value is not zero. This can be due to well-known estimation issues for low number of raters. To learn more, read our paper published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series A uh, earlier this year. Uh, our methods and um, interpretations are implemented and available for you to try in an interactive software, Shiny Item Analysis. 
New function ECC restricted provides estimates of interact reliability in restricted samples. And in the interactive app, you can select the ratio of top or bottom proposals. Here it's 83%. And here you see the part of the proposals that is uh, used for calculation of the inter rate reliability. And here on the right, you will find the estimate of inter rate reliability together with, um, uh, together with the confidence interval. The software then provides interpretation and also a sample R code to replicate the analysis in R. Uh, to conclude, uh, we demonstrated that estimating local interrater reliability from subsets of restricted quality proposals will likely result in zero estimates, even when, when the interrater reliability from the full sample is not zero. The question then is, is it valid to interpret range restricted interrater reliability estimates as indicators of peer review quality when the reviewers were in fact asked to score grant proposals across the whole range of submissions? And our answer is no, at least not from the measurement standpoint. When reviewers are asked to differentiate among grant proposals across the whole range of submissions, we recommend against using restricted range local interrate reliability. If review scores are intended to be used for differentiating among top proposals, we recommend peer review administrators and researchers to align uh, review procedures with their intended measurement. Uh, finally, we demonstrated how interactive software, uh, shiny item analysis, may be used to support dissemination, replicability, and open science. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to any further feedback uh, or comments. And uh, here are some references and my acknowledgements. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, Patricia. That was absolutely fascinating. And as Patricia says, if you have questions, if you'd like to discuss with her or with any other of the presenters in this session, please do go to the Remo platform after the end of this session. Uh, next up, we have Cassio Amorim, who is talking about SciGen Report, which is a platform for sharing reproducibility information. So, uh, Cassio, please can you come to the stage? If you can unmute, share your video. I cannot share my video apparently. Share your um, video. Uh, see if we can do that. Okay. It's Here right. we go. Thank okay. You. We try to share my screen just a second. I hope you can see. Let's give it a sec. I think we're not quite seeing your slides yet. Hmm. Do you want to try and? Try and move them forward, move a slide forward. Uh -huh. Um. Perhaps, Cassie, if we come back to you, um, I'll okay. have a quick chat with you and you can share okay. your slides with sure. me and we'll figure that out. Yes. Um, we will pop on to the next person who is Daniel Drevon, who is talking about a database to support aggregation of evidence from single case experimental designs. So, Daniel, if you are ready, um, if you can hop onto the stage. Okay. And if you can start your. All right, good. Off you go, Daniel. Please do start. Can you see me? Yep. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Daniel Gervon. Oh, got a prompt yep. to start my video. There I am. Okay. 
Um, hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Gervon. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Central Michigan University. I'm here to tell you uh, today about a tool my team and I are building, uh, a repository or a database to support aggregation of evidence from single case experimental design. Um, and I do want to acknowledge my uh, two doctoral students, Allison Furt and Elizabeth Koval, who have been uh, a huge help uh, with this project. So I'm a school psychologist by training, and that's a discipline that sits at the nexus of, of education and psychology. So I'm interested in evaluating the effectiveness of academic and behavioral interventions that are um, implemented in school-based settings. So methodologically, um, I, I investigate that using single case experimental design. And over the last few years, I've become really interested in quantitative analysis of data yielded through single case experimental designs, and especially the aggregation of evidence from single case designs um, and meta-analyses. So um, along with randomized controlled trials and quasi-experimental designs, single case designs contribute to the conversation about evidence-based interventions in education and psychology and some other fields as well. Um, so when they're designed and executed well, single case designs are able to answer questions about whether an independent variable uh, caused a change in a dependent variable or variables. Um, this type of design isn't uh, super commonly known, so I thought I'd talk about some of their core characteristics. Um, one is that cases, and that usually means individuals, are the unit of analysis, so individuals serve as their own controls. Um, these designs are also characterized by researcher manipulated independent variables, um, ongoing and repeated measurement of dependent variables before, during, and after the introduction of an independent variable. Um, and then something that's kind of unique is that the data are displayed graphically and analyzed visually. Um, so you don't see integration of, of traditional inferential statistics typically in this type of design. Um, and this design is used often um, in, in educational psychological research, um, often to study low incidence population. So despite this sort of tr strong tradition of visual analysis among researchers who use single case experimental designs, it has some disadvantages, um, namely problems with iterator reliability. So whether two people come to the same conclusion about the data that are displayed visually. Um, so partially as a response to this, methodologists and statisticians have developed um, several different quantitative approaches to analyzing and aggregating data from single case design. Um, so take a look at this figure for an example of how data might be graphed in a single case design. Um, so this, this is a, a common way to look at a data. So where the y-axis reflects some dimension of behavior, um, in this case, uh, it's the percent of observation intervals that, uh, say, a second grade student exhibits on task behavior, which we could operationalize further as reading, writing, or orienting toward the teacher. The x axis reflects time, sometimes that's days, sessions, could be weeks. Um, and then different phases of the experiment are reflected by the vertical lines, where there's baseline and intervention condition. So visually analyzing these data would involve looking at characteristics um, like trend, like um, variability, and then uh, things like immediacy of behavior change when a phase change occurs. And so, so these vi this visual analysis can help us determine whether an intervention caused a change in, in behavior. So one problem we face for folks who are interested in quantitative analysis of, of these data uh, or aggregating these data is uh, uh, relates to the fact that we need the numerical data from the graphical displays included in studies. Um, researchers typically don't report the X, Y coordinates of the data points included in the graphical displays, um, such as the one in the figure I showed. Um, yet they are needed to carry out most quantitative approaches to single case data analysis. Um, in order to obtain these values, there's lots of uh, different plot digitizing tools out there that can help us extract the data and then spreadsheet software can help us manage the numerical values um, that we extract. Um, this is a screen grab from a plot digitizing tool called Web Plot Digitizer. Um, and, and basically what these tools require us to do is upload graphs. So that's the same figure that I showed you earlier. Um, it requires us to configure the axes to superimpose a coordinate system on the graph, 
It requires us to manually click each data point, and then it requires us to export those values to a spreadsheet for management. Um, as you can imagine, um, there's a significant amount of time and effort involved in extracting numerical values from graphical displays included in, sing included in single case design, and that causes a considerable burden for researchers involved in the development and use of quantitative approaches uh, to single case data analysis. So as a potential solution, our team is creating a repository of numerical values extracted from graphical displays included in single case design. The idea is that folks interested in quantitatively analyzing or aggregating these data could locate um, spreadsheets of the studies they're interested in, download those data, and then go on and analyze those data in, in any way they see fit. The data are formatted in a way that easily read into our, 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 our studio or SPSS, and it's also compatible with uh, a variety of different packages that are commonly used in analyzing these sorts of data. Um, the idea is that the repository would uh, facilitate more timely and less effortful evidence synthesis. Um, it, would also re it would also reduce duplication of time and effort across research teams interested in similar research questions, and it would standardize some elements of data management. And it seems to be uh, increasingly important um, in this time as evidence synthesis of single case designs has been accelerating very rapidly in the last decade or so. Um, and so ultimately reducing time and effort associated with evidence synthesis would allow findings to get into the hands of practitioners and policymakers uh, quicker than they otherwise would. So this project is underway. Um, this summer we identified about 500 single case uh, experiments published in school psychology journals uh, from their inception through 2020. And we've been able to extract data from 265 of those studies um, to date. Those data are um, formatted and managed and, and housed on, on OSF. Um, and, and, and so in terms of moving forward, the goal is to complete our data extraction and management for the single case designs published in the school psychology journal, but then also expand this to be bigger um, and include data from special education journals and perhaps even journals in behavior analysis or, or other disciplines down the line. Um, so that's a quick overview of, of the project we've got going. Um, if you're interested in single case experimental design um, or, or, or this type of, uh, of, of tool, uh, I'd be happy to talk more. I have my Twitter handle and email there. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, yes, if you'd like to talk to Daniel, you can hop into Remo after this session. And now back by popular demand, let's have another go with Cassio. Um, so Cassio, if you can come to the stage and I will share my screen. Sure. Hopefully, can you see those okay? Yes, can see that, thank you. Excellent, just give me a, give me a shout when you want to change. Okay, I will tell you. So um, once again, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm Cassio with CJS Inc. in Kyoto. And today I want to talk about the Saigen Report, which is a platform for sharing reproducibility information that I've developed. Uh, so um, before we go straight into the platform, uh, please, next slide. Uh, let's be on the same page here on the matter of um, the issues. Uh, so we're focusing here on reproducibility. And well, when we talk about reproducibility in recent years, uh, we have uh, several issues perhaps uh, that come to mind, but well, certainly the foremost example or the first thing that comes to mind is the so-called uh, reproducibility crisis that happens in some fields where only a small fraction or perhaps not so small, but only a fraction of papers seem to be actually reproducible. And actually there are other issues. So um, for example, scientists in general, um, they are not much willing uh, to do replication work. It's not that much appealing. And then communication tends to be slow to communication regarding reproducibility, of course. And not only in the academic medium, uh, in the industry, and well, I actually work in the private sector. Um, there is also uh, a lot of issues. The communication between industry and academics uh, it depends a lot, of course, but it tends to be quite difficult. Um, perhaps not so much if you are a very rigid uh, uh, company, but uh, in general, it tends to be actually quite difficult. And this makes the, the, the dialogue 
regarding um, the, the stages of reproducibility quite hard for uh, everyone. And of course, there are cases of fraud that, again, they tend to they, take, they tend to take long to detect and to be corrected. So um, please, next slide. So here we do, uh, in the center of all that, we have the problem when you have a paper in our hands. Uh, is this paper reproducible? And there are ways to tackle this question. You may ask around. And well, ask around has its own issues. We have limited information if you ask for your colleagues. Uh, or perhaps, of course, we may all try to look on the web for answers and even using websites like PeerHub, which are great platforms. But still, it can be hard to filter for the uh, objectivity that we want uh, in research. And of course, you can try yourself, which is great by itself, and we should be doing a lot, in my opinion. Um, but of course, there are also um, some uh, issues related to that, too. Uh, it is hard then to share your findings or our findings. and usually recognitions that do not come along with it. So, which links to what I just said, but note that, that uh, in general, scientists are not much willing to do this kind of work because of the lack of recognition is part of it. So uh, this, my, uh, the platform, please next slide. Uh, this platform that, uh, uh, that I'm suggesting here is a suggested solution is this platform called Saiga Report, which is a very simple platform. Um, this is the, the opening page where you just look for a DOI and what the platform does is to just fetch the metadata of this DOI and you can go to the next slide to have a look at what it does, which is, as I said, very simple. You have here on the top left, pretty much what it does. It takes this metadata of uh, title and authors, publisher, etc., and the point here is actually that users can then post their reports. So it is in a way a way to tackle uh, the the questions that or the issues that I've uh, listed uh, in a way that you can then uh, actually, if you try it by yourself, now you can share your knowledge with others, and you have this register which may give you some recognition. And at the same time, if you are looking for what other people did, you have a place where you can have this, uh, these comments, like in the um, bottom right uh, screenshot, what you have is essentially what a report looks like uh, for now, um, which is a short comment. And, and actually, if, they reproduce, if the, the paper was reproducible or not, uh, to what degree, if it was totally reproducible, partially reproducible, not reproducible at all. And you can see this, there is a circle. Uh, it might be a bit hard to see depending on your screen, but there is a circle that gives the summary there uh, together with the metadata uh, of how many people tried and what was the overall uh, result, how many succeeded, how many people failed on their attempt. Uh, so you can have some uh, simple, but at least useful uh, filter for uh, objectivity. And not only that, if you go to the next slide, uh, users uh, also have their, say, public profile, where you have all the attempts of uh, all the reports in attempts of uh, reproducing, replicating a paper and what they uh, obtained. So, well, you could attach this to your CV or something like that. Now, um, as I said, it is a simple but quite useful platform. Then if you go to the next slide, we can see uh, there are still, well, this is the, the uh, questions or the issues tackled. And of course, there are still remaining issues in the next slide. Uh, we is still, well, it is still hard. Reproducibility is hard and we may, should ask ourselves, well, should it be hard? Well, I, I think not, but it's a whole big question that we cannot solve easily. Um, and also there are all the issues on how to engage people on actually reproducing research and whether this kind of uh, platform is enough reward recognition. Uh, is that enough to, to um, prompt people and invite people into actually sharing? I, I think such kind of platforms could be especially good for, uh, say, students, uh, grad students uh, who gain a lot by trying to reproduce research and research papers. They can, we can get a lot of knowledge from that in grad school. And although, uh, especially depending on your field, it might be hard to publish early on in your career uh, or even uh, if you're not planning for a career in academia, it can be 
sometimes hard to publish uh, a, a result, but yet you have a means to show that you are actually active, actively contributing somehow to the knowledge of the field by giving such kind of, uh, of information to everyone. So uh, that's, that's it. Uh, if you are interested, please uh, come and talk to me. I will be in Remo. And as a last, uh, as a last piece and advertisement that we will have a, a panel next week uh, to talk precisely about engaging the community on research reproducibility, I'll be the moderator. So we will actually listen to the other four uh, great uh, researchers that to give their uh, knowledge on that and their opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was worth the wait. Thanks very much, Cassio. So if we can go to our next speaker, we have uh, Dragan Okanovic, who is speaking about Unfold Research, the web for science. So uh, let's get up and ready. Hello, um, can you see the screen? Uh, yep, do you need to go to present? There yes. we are, yep, gotcha. Okay, uh, thank you all for being here and uh, big thanks to the organizers of the conference. It's a great opportunity, a lot of interesting talks. So my name is Dragan, today I'll be talking about Unfold Research and I'm the founder of that project. And like one speaker yesterday noted, uh, it seems that we are talking more about problems that exist in science and meta science, uh, but we rarely often the solutions. And so I'll be focusing on delivering a solution. Basically Unfold Research is a project uh, that tries to uh, achieve what open science was always about, about openness and being able to access all the additional materials that other people could use to replicate uh, outputs and other work. Uh, but they also kind of lack the tools to do just that. And they lack the incentives to do that because any additional work besides uh, doing the actual research, uh, like nobody's bothered to reward that. The way that we are doing that actually is by providing uh, tools and services that uh, measure different kinds of metrics that measure a broader scope of activities and uh, various different types of research work, whether it be replication studies, negative studies, peer review, uh, or perhaps data verification or just collection. Uh, we want to reward all of those. And the way that we're going to incentivize that is uh, by measuring all of them, uh, giving some value to all of those research outputs, and basically paying researchers for their contributions to the community. We will let the community assess how valuable and impactful those additions have been. And based on that, we're going to pay the researchers more concretely, what we are developing is currently a browser extension that you install and basically it sits there for you. And as you're browsing the internet, uh, you will be notified if there is some additional content posted by the community members. The, all the entries that are posted are posted for a specific paper or a specific URL. Uh, so all the content you can expect to be of super high relevance to what you're currently looking at. Uh, all, all the content could be of a various type, whether it be uh, something regarding replication or data or perhaps a review. So we kind of offer uh, various different modules uh, that you can attach and link to the papers. Uh, so it's kind of very flexible. Uh, the community is able to cast votes on all of the entries, uh, which makes, makes sorting and filtering through uh, perhaps a bunch of content much easier. And it gives you a very clear indication of what the community thinks is the highest quality content and perhaps of the highest relevance. And uh, for authors, uh, based on the amount of uh, impact and kind of points that they've collected during a period of time, let's say a week, uh, they will earn the money for uh, those contributions. Uh, the collective research fund uh, that we will be making uh, grows through user subscriptions, uh, which are kind of premium model. Um, and we kind of expect uh, always there to be more consumers of the content than creators, uh, which creates this kind of balance where uh, consumers of the content can pay for continued work of the content creators to continue uh, creating new content and publishing and making it discoverable for everyone. And other than subscriptions, uh, also including individual or organizational, private and public funders and investors. And we're also considering adding an uh, option for a Web3 token, uh, similar perhaps to some other projects that are working with blockchain technology. And perhaps even as a very simple and short demo, 
uh, I just want to sh share that uh, like as you're browsing the web and reading specific papers or techniques, uh, you have your browser extension and it just notifies you if you have some relevant materials and you can access it and just browse it. Uh, the material can be of various type. It could be something more uh, rich media that you could never even fit into the papers that are very static in nature, or they could be something more just textual and uh, that summarize perhaps some of the things and link some of the additional materials. Uh, so some of the benefits that we actually get from that is uh, for authors, this is a completely new and an extremely powerful distribution channel that they never had before uh, because now authors are able to link their new papers and new work and data to the older papers so as people are reading older papers they are now uh, able to discover newer materials and uh, perhaps just uh, like confirmations of older work or rejections uh, and they can uh, just make make that those uh, yeah available um, this is extremely powerful because we had uh, references from before, but those were always able to point from older work to the uh, from newer work to the older work. But now we are completely uh, finally able to point from the older work to the newer one. So discoverability is improved significantly, and especially authors can now target their audience, uh, a very narrow audience very directly simply because the people that are reading specific papers are the audience that they want to show their new work uh, to and so any additional content it could be also uh, author provided annotation notes uh, any kind of data that uh, you could not even fit in the paper not even on a paper server you now have the ability to post it and uh, just let it be discoverable by anybody Definitely for authors, kind of the biggest benefit and practical benefit is uh, enabling them to do continued research and earn a salary uh, on their uh, for their contributions. Uh, for readers, uh, the value proposition is perhaps a more direct one. Uh, they are now able to uh, find relevant content directly, uh, access some things that perhaps not even search engines uh, would uh, were able to index and follow show to them um, and now suddenly all of the gray kind of literature and all of the additional materials whether it be twitter threads that everybody found useful or youtube explainer videos all of that now has a home where you can actually host it and make it directly accessible and findable and that kind of knowledge repository grows over time and is curated by the community so its value is just growing over time um, we want to make this a tool that is your like daily companion that you use multiple times a day. Uh, we don't necessarily see as a replacement for all of the tools that exist now. We actually think this works best as a, in tandem with other tools, for example, using Google Scholar to find the exact paper that you're interested in, but using these, this browser extension to discover and browse the other relevant materials. And uh, so the project is work in progress, but as you've seen uh, in the demo, uh, it's very much live and we do have a private testing phase. So if you're interested in getting an early access, uh, definitely reach out to us uh, by some of the ways posted here. Uh, we are more than happy to hear any feedback requests or comments. Uh, so yeah, feel free to reach out uh, with that. Uh, thank you. And yeah, back to the moderators. Thank you very much for that. So for our last talk of this session, we have a um, quadruple act. I think it's like the Avengers of open science, possibly. Uh, so we have Cosette Coma, we have Nathaniel Porter, Jenny Kirsch and Matthew Cagle talking about evidence based training in transparency, replicability and evidence synthesis, a pedagogical review. So I will leave it to all four of you to do your thing. Once your slides are up. Thank you so much, Kat. And yes, we have a lot of people and a long title. Uh, so once, uh, are we good to go? Yep, you're all good to go. Awesome, thank you. All right, so my name is Cosette and I'm the Evidence Synthesis Librarian at the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. I'm joined here today by um, my collaborator and coworker, Nathaniel Porter, who is the Social Science Data Consultant and Data Education Coordinator. Um, we are also very lucky to have with us today 
our uh, two students who worked with us over the summer on this evidence-based training in transparency, replicability, and evidence synthesis, uh, Jennifer Kirsch and Matthew Cable. Before uh, I pass it off to them, I'm just gonna give a kind of overview of why we're doing this, uh, knowing full well that everybody at this conference probably already understands and, and feels the same way that we do about how important this sort of work is. Uh, primary research ultimately at some uh, capacity is intended to have real life application, but it's best to have that primary research be filtered through a synthesis or replication or both uh, sort of process. Synthesis and replication depend on transparent and open reporting. And so it's important that that becomes part of the standard sort of process for primary research. All of this is couched in a research culture, which has been thematic throughout this entire uh, conference, right? This development of a graduate course uh, is our kind of way of combating the metal, meta bubbling uh, that Till Bruckner mentioned during the lightning talks yesterday. Um, there is a lot that we can do in this area, but this is one small contribution we think we can make uh, to kind of enhance this culture. We want to, oh, um, so our, our like summary of our mission is to leverage the notion of synthesizing and replicating research as a means of demonstrating the importance and value of transparent and open reporting to budding researchers and research users. We wanna both uh, preach and teach and also live this kind of value. So we have a three part sort of approach and we are currently at our foundational research kind of wrap up phase where we're moving into the course development phase. And we plan to have our course pilot in the fall of 2022. Today, we're mostly going to be presenting the foundational research methods and also um, some findings. So with that, I'll pass it off to Jenny. Hi, my name is Jennifer Kirsch. I'm a doctoral candidate in counselor education at Virginia Tech, and I served as the summer graduate assistant alongside Cosette and Nathaniel. Um, I conducted a structured review of the social sciences literature for examples of higher education pedagogy that used and addressed trace and open science concepts. The final product was an annotated bibliography of the literature that I found, which indicated predominant use of replication-based projects and experiential pedagogical approaches in the field of psychology uh, to teach undergraduates. So little literature currently exists uh, that I could find discussing or demonstrating practical applications of contemporary pedagogical approaches to instructing graduate level students in the social sciences about open science subjects, and even less exist concerning pedagogical approaches to teaching systematic reviews and systematic review processes uh, within higher education. So currently I'm working with Cosette and Dr. Porter to write a conceptual article about the development of a graduate level trace course um, that would emphasize systematic reviews as well as the other uh, open science concepts that we've talked about today. Hi, my name is Matthew Cagle. I'm the undergraduate uh, student working along with the team. I conducted a course materials review specifically analyzing course catalogs and collecting relevant syllabi. First, I analyzed the course catalogs of 24 graduate level research intensive institutes. I focused my structured search on the TRES keywords. Once I collected these courses uh, descriptions that were semi-relevant, I utilized quantitative content analysis on the descriptions to determine the most relevant courses. What I discovered is that there was a lack of graduate level courses focused around evidence uh, analysis with the courses that did mention the topic, majorly were focusing on teaching general statistical research methods. Uh, with the list of relevant courses I collected, an email was sent out to the professors to collect those syllabi, along with the OSF repository that we used to collect a larger portion of the syllabi. And then with the syllabi, Nathaniel utilized LDA topic modeling and epistemic network analysis to find patterns within them. Oh, that went backwards. Because why don't you just show the entire slide then? I was trying to be cool and avoid spoilers. So uh, uh, as Matt said, we used uh, both topic modeling and epistemic network analysis, which is a network-based um, uh, quantitative approach. It's called part of what's called quantitative ethnography um, and detected. There should be one more click, I think. I hope. There we go. <laughs> Um, um, 
we don't have time to go into all the methods, but we did find some interesting findings as far as sort of a range of genres, I'll call them, in graduate courses related to these three topics of transparency, replication, and evidence synthesis. Um, so under the general heading of primarily transparency and replication focus courses, which is uh, a good chunk of these, uh, there are sort of two storylines, right? Uh, one is science crisis, a true crime story, um, where uh, there's this replication crisis, nobody trusts science, what are we gonna do and so on. And, but there's also the flip story, which is uh, open science is great. Um, maybe this isn't so much as a crisis, it's an opportunity, right? And so the top figure you see on the right, this is the epistemic network uh, diagram of the relationship of those topics. Transparency goes with replicability. Sorry, it's so small, um, but you see uh, sort of transparency is the hub for everything. And the other topics, experiments, uh, inference, meta-analysis, structured review are all sort of connected primarily through that one hub of transparency and replication. Uh, as Matt mentioned, a lot of the courses that touch on these topics are really just methods courses in methods for psychology or sociology or whatever the discipline is, health science. Um, and there were two sort of subgenres in here. Um, one is courses that sort of focused on the history of science and how science is developing and how, hey, this open science thing is part of what's getting better. And then also, um, the more classic sort of methods in my discipline. Um, but hey, now we know that we can do these other things to make it a little bit better. We can do transparency, we can do reproducibility. So there's some discussion. And you notice in these, it's the second diagram here. Um, there's a lot more connections between sort of the loosely tied concepts. So things that are uh, important for transparency, replicability, evidence synthesis, but aren't um, sort of at the core story that you might hear here at MetaScience, say. Um, and then uh, there's a limited number of evidence synthesis focused courses on evidence synthesis and along with that reproducible practices. So you don't lose transparency and replication, but there's a Dr. Narwhal that was the closest I could get to a unicorn because these are extremely rare courses. There's only a few of them we found in US universities. Um, and they're primarily focused in health sciences. Um, so this gives us an opportunity um, as we develop the course, which is the real goal of all this research, um, this background research sort of helps us think not only about how to frame the course so that it can have the most positive influence in the lives of these young scholars and in science in general, um, but also to see where there might be challenges and things. So one of our focuses will be to integrate systematic review, meta-analysis, evidence synthesis with the classic transparency and replication concerns. And there is information in our OSF project and information for us. And we'd love to talk afterwards in the remote room, I'm sure. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the presenters in this session. You've all kept to time fantastically. I'm just going to literally hit go. Um, so please do join the presenters and other attendees in Remo afterwards. I've just popped the link in the chat. And um, thank you very much for your attention for this session. Our next session is going to be on registered reports. That will be in about half an hour. So starting at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 4 p.m. UK time. So uh, go and join everyone in Remo. Thank you very much for your attention and have a lovely evening if you're on UK time, daytime, if you're over on uh, in the States, or I think I'm not even sure what day it is if you're in Australia. Thank you very much.